there are some things you don't say. Uh, depending on who is listening, depending on where you're at, there are certain things you don't say. For instance, there are some things that you don't say at a PETA convention, like where can a guy get a good hamburger? <laughs> or at a NASCAR rally, sorry I'm late, I had to recharge my electric car. Things you don't say at the Apple technology store, like, I'm an Android user myself. Something you don't say at a biker bar, I'll have a Diet Pepsi free, please. Something you don't say at the Chicago Bears cheering section, go Packers. Something you don't say at the Minnesota Vikings cheering section, go Packers. Something you don't say at the Dallas Cowboys cheering section. Go Packers! And something you don't say, don't say at the National Rifle Association conference. Fire! All right. There are some things you just don't say. They might be considered inflammatory. They might be considered downright dangerous or foolish. In the past couple years, there have been a lot of controversies surrounding what people should say or shouldn't even be allowed to say on college campuses and on social media. Have you picked up on that? Canada has been tightening the screws about what can and can't be said when you have certain religious convictions. There's a, a court case started in 2017, a legal battle that began over Derek and Francis Bars. They were foster parents with two little girls under their care, ages three and four. And a child support worker insisted that they tell the girls, cover your children's ears, that the Easter Bunny is real. Derek said this, we explained to the agency that we're not prepared to tell the children a lie. If the children asked, we would not lie to them, but we wouldn't bring it up ourselves. Well, the bars are members of a Presbyterian Reformed Church, they're convinced that lying, as in telling children something is true when it's not, is morally wrong. So the bar's eligibility as foster parents was revoked, and the children were taken out from their care over the bunny. Uh, that was changed in a later decision, but that's the kind of thing that's starting to happen there. If not affirming a four-year-old that the Easter Bunny is reality gets children removed from a foster home, then what happens to parents who refuse to affirm an older child's gender confusion? You know the answer to that. Culture has decided there are some things you don't say. And we are surrounded by policymakers who've decided to make a list of words that you can't say and words that you must say or else you're oppressive and you need to be shut down somehow. Jesus' culture wanted to tell him to do the same thing. Mark, open up to the book of Mark. We're in chapter 2 today. Mark records several times when Jesus said and did some things that were not acceptable to the policymakers of the time. You see, they reasoned that they were the ones who had authority when it came to knowing God's word and how to apply God's word. So in all matters, religious and moral, they were the ones who would settle what a person could and couldn't say. And when Jesus stepped out of bounds and said something otherwise, they blew gasket. I love those parts. I'll go you one even further this morning. Jesus not only said some things that weren't allowable by the cultural policymakers of his day, he also uh, said some things that wouldn't have been acceptable in the, the uh, policy culture makers of our day. Let me pull up some examples of that. No one person should ever do or say certain things unless they have authority to do it. No one person should say the things that Jesus said, and we wouldn't tolerate it today without saying about him that he's just a nut job. So what's the big deal with what Jesus said? And how can we reconcile that 
with the idea that he is at least a good person. The only way to deal with that is look at what he said. And when we look at the things that Jesus said, we're going to see some things. This week, I, I went through the book of Mark and I pulled up everything that Jesus said and, and the things that he said that are things you just don't say. Here's what comes out of those. First of all, only the rule maker has a right to change the rules. Only the rule maker. Once in a while, we'll get together with friends and play cards around our kitchen table. And when you sit down to play cards, uh, first thing you've got to do if it's a game that you haven't played recently is you've got to establish the rules, right? They vary from house to house. And if you don't take care of that, you may end up with some controversy later. Why ruin a friendship? There are two ways that you can set up the rules. One way is to get everybody's consensus, right? Let's all agree that it's going to be this way. If you're down to one card and you don't knock and someone catches you, that's a 50-point penalty, all right? We all agree on that. So you take a consensus. The other way is to consult a source, right? Get the rule book of card games or find it online. That way, it's outside of the group. And if a question comes up, you just go back to the source and check it. Or you can go by house rules. That's kind of the same thing. There's one person who gets to call the shot. There's an authority. Well, that's good in card games. On the court, on the field, at the table, the only rule maker is the one, whoever it might be, who has the right to change the rules. Isn't that right? In the courtroom, in the classroom, in the boardroom, it's the same, too. Whoever is the rule maker is the one who has the right to change the rules. When Jesus hit the scene and he started interfering with the rules in his culture, it raised some blood pressure and it raised some objections. Chapter 2, Jesus describes what him coming and doing this was like. He said it was like new wine, and it's got to be put into new wineskins so that they can handle it without bursting. He said it's like taking a, a patch that you sew on a garment, and it's got to be pre-shrunk, because if it's not, it will shrink later, and it will tear the garment. I think most people are familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. Here we go. Old, okay, audience participation time. How many of you are familiar with the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament? This is not a trick question. All right. Thank you. Everybody. The Jews actually had looked back at the whole Testament and had counted all of the commandments. You know there are more than 10. 613. They call it the Teriag Mitzvot. And then for years, Jewish teachers had taken the Teriag Mitzvot, and they had refined and defined and interpreted and enhanced those into a much more complex code of rules, which included a lot more rules about keeping the Sabbath and about the things that you could eat and how you could eat. And those are the rules in their eyes. You don't question those. You don't change those. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, they had commandeered God's law as if it belonged to them and made it their own. But then Jesus comes along. And he says things like in chapter 2, verse 27, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Who is the Son of Man? That's Jesus. Jesus just said about himself, he is what? Lord of the Sabbath. What person is Lord of any day, let alone of the Sabbath day? You don't say that unless you're Jesus. Chapter 7, verse 18, look what he says. He's speaking there about food. He says, whatever food goes into a person from outside cannot defile him, since it enters not his heart but his stomach and is expelled. And Mark adds this comment, thus Jesus declared all foods clean. In celebration of that, I had bacon yesterday. <laughs> With just a few words, Jesus began changing the rules. He wasn't changing just how the rabbis interpreted the Old Covenant. Only the rule maker has the right to do that. Only God has the right to change the parameters of his creation. 
Here's one more. Jesus sat with his disciples at the Last Supper, we call it, before his crucifixion. Chapter 14, verse 22. As they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Do you see what Jesus said as he did this? Jesus was introducing a new covenant. A whole new covenant. God had predicted it hundreds of years before, and now Jesus is bringing in a whole new way for mankind to relate to God. And his blood, he said, was the blood of that whole new covenant. Jesus had a right that no one else had. This year, we've been following this theme, I'm in. And it's a year-long challenge for every one of us to be completely given over to Jesus, completely given over to his plan for our lives. Are you in? We're going to keep asking it. And this point is a very crucial point of that challenge. If you're in Jesus, you are accepting that Jesus has the right to set the rules for life because he is the one who created your life. That's what it means to call Jesus Lord. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, agreeing that Jesus is Lord means that you are agreeing that Jesus is your Lord. And if he's your Lord, then he's in charge. It means that you come to him on his terms because only he has the right to say what those are. You don't say that you're changing the rules that God put in place unless you're the one who made the rules in the first place. Can I get a uh-huh? Only Jesus could say such things. Here's something else that we'll also see when we look at what Jesus said. We'll see that, the, that only the standard of right and wrong has the authority to declare us forgiven. Let me try something here this morning. A couple of simple questions that you can ask anyone who questions whether if, if God even exists, that he must not be a fair God, or who look at you and say, you know, Christianity is a really narrow-minded attitude. Let me ask these two questions of you. We're going to get some audience participation, and these are questions that you can use. Try this at home, kids. All right, here we go. Number one, how many of you believe that crime deserves punishment, that there should be some form of consequences for doing something morally wrong? How many of you believe that there should be a punishment? This is not a trick question, okay? There should be a punishment for doing something wrong. Well, sure. I mean, let me ask it a little more thoroughly. If someone commits some horrendous murder, that person shouldn't just be let off, right? The person who robs orphans and widows, the person who sets houses on fire, the person who kicks puppies, there should be some consequences when people do things that are wrong. Amen? Most people will agree with that. If you can't agree with that, I'm kind of scared to be around you. So everybody would pretty much agree with that. Here's the second question then. Okay, audience participation. How many of you believe that you, at some point, have done something that was morally wrong? Not a trick question. How many of you? Okay, those of you who are not raising your hand, I would like to sit by you. You're perfect. <laughs> Anything? Just go back to the list of Ten Commandments, for starters. Did you ever break just one of the Ten Commandments? You know, James says, whoever keeps the whole law and yet fails at one point has become guilty of all of it. And it puts us all in the same place. When you ask someone those two questions, you and that someone are now in the exact same place, needing to be rescued from the mess where we have stepped. Somewhere there is a standard of right and wrong. Somewhere we know it. There's a standard. Whoever set up that standard is the one who has the authority to say whether or not we can be forgiven. 
What I need, what you need, is to find who can take us from deserving punishment to some different status. I want that different status. How about you? So let's look at what Jesus says. You remember the the little town of Capernaum on the northern edge of the Sea of Galilee? That house, the house of Peter, where Jesus stayed? Let's go there with Jesus. Chapter 2 of Mark, beginning in verse 1. He's there at that house. When he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like this? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? That really is the key question, isn't it? Who can do that? The answer is nobody. They got that right. They're questioning what Jesus just said. Verse 8, immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Only God can forgive someone's sins. Our sins are an offense against God in the first place. He's the one that has to deal with them. Others try to put themselves in the position of granting forgiveness to people. You know what? They're wrong. Even the scribes understood this is a God-only thing. And none of those who claim this authority, by the way, demonstrate that they have that authority by saying to a paralyzed person, get up and healing them. And Jesus is the only one to say things that you don't say and then show his authority by predicting his own resurrection. Only Jesus shows that he can say those things you don't say. You know, if you're in Jesus, you're someone whose sin has been let go. Isn't that good news? God has declared your punishment paid. Just like the old hymn says, for God the just, for Uh, God the just is satisfied to look on him and for me to be forgiven. Now that's true this morning, not because I said it, not because I said I remove your guilt. That's something you don't say unless you're the one who's got the authority to do that. Only Jesus. I want to look at one more thing that you don't say that Jesus did say, and we're going to see this, that only the perfect God-man can take away our sin. It's the darkest hour, and Jesus has been arrested. He has been hauled off into an illegitimate late-night court where they're going to try to find him guilty and get him condemned. Liars have stood up and have given false testimony one after another, but their testimony doesn't match each other, and so none of it proves anything. Nobody was coming up with any accusations against Jesus that would stick. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, Jesus kept quiet. He didn't stand there and say, no, no, what they're saying isn't true. You're not saying what I said. You can't keep me here. It's wrong. Let me go. Mark chapter 14, verse 61. 
It says he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. What, did Jesus just get lost in the moment and blurt out something he didn't mean to say? No. With those words, Jesus claimed to be the Christ. He claimed to be the Messiah, the Son of God. And just to make sure there was no mistaking what he meant, he added that one day they, all of them, it's a plural you, you will see me seated in power and coming on the clouds in glory. Those are things you just don't say. And it was with these words that Jesus cemented his own verdict and execution. Are you him? I sure am. And one day you're all going to see it. And that was enough for them to pronounce him guilty. You don't say those things. You know what's going on here is a fulfillment of what Jesus said in chapter 10, verse 45. The key verse to the whole book of Mark where Jesus said, remember it? The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give himself as a ransom for many. When you hear Jesus say that, by the way, don't make the mistake of thinking that he's Casper Milk Toast. <laughs> that, that poor fellow who just came to serve everybody. When he did that, what he did was Make a thrust of divine power unlike anything else, different from what anybody else could do. See, it's one thing to have your debt canceled. It's, it's one thing to have your legal status changed from guilty to innocent. I want that. I know I want that. But it is another thing then to be able to look into the mirror every day and to live with that person who has been forgiven and didn't deserve it. You need to understand that Jesus came to be our ransom. Look at the word he used, our rescuer. There's only one person who could do that, and it was a person who had to be free from sin himself so that he could pay the debt that I owe. He didn't owe it himself. And he had to be a person who is God, who is eternal, who could forgive my eternal punishment. But it was more than just removing my guilt. Jesus came also to remove what sin does to me. Are you listening? God doesn't just want to remove your guilt. He wants to remove your sinfulness. 1 Peter 2.24, Peter said, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you've been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. The only way that you or I will ever see the power of sin and its effects in our lives be taken away is to have Jesus take them away. You can't do this on your own. You need to be in Christ. You need to have Christ in you. He's the one that set that up. He is Lord. He can forgive your sins. He's the Christ, the Messiah. He's going to return in power. Yes, Jesus said all those things, things that you just don't say, unless you're Jesus. Are you in? If you're in then you're someone this morning who says, yes, Jesus said those things, and yes, I agree wholeheartedly with every one of them. I believe it is true. Only Jesus had the right. Only Jesus had the authority. Only Jesus had the power to say those things, things you just don't say. If you're not in this morning, I hope you're listening. I hope you're listening to the one who is calling you to be in him. You need him. I need him. We even held our hands up and agreed. We're in a pickle, aren't we? And only Jesus can help us with that. So it's not with pride that anyone stands up and says, I'm inviting you on Jesus' behalf to come to him. 
He invited me. He invites you. And this morning, you could become his. If you're not in, if you haven't made that decision, then please understand this morning it means acknowledging that Jesus really is Lord and saying, I'm going to have Jesus be Lord of my life. It means saying, uh, I'm going to turn away from the way I was living. It's called repentance. And I'm going to go the direction that the Lord wants me to go. It means being baptized into him. Something that Jesus showed us by his example and something that he gave to us as the moment that we could look at and say, yep, I died, I was buried, and that old person is gone. And I was raised to walk a new life. That could be you this morning. If you're ready to make that choice, we want to invite you to do that. Would you stand up with me, please? What we're going to do is have a word of prayer together. We are going to uh, sing a song together. Anytime from now to the time that we dismiss from here, if you're needing to make the decision to acknowledge Jesus as Lord in your life this morning, then we're inviting you to come and do that right down here at the front. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we have a word that's clear, that doesn't change. Thank you for the things that Jesus said unapologetically, things that make him different, things that help us to see right away that he stands out unique, not just a man, but the man who was God in flesh. How we need his authority in our lives, how we need his forgiveness that comes through him, Father, I pray today that that would become reality for someone that hasn't made that choice yet. Please remove the hindrances. Father, please remove the distractions or anything that makes it seem somehow okay not to be in a right relationship with you. Use this time to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.